in this episode we are going to cover many topics including uh, you know artificial photosynthesis desalination carbon capture humidity and covid-19 connection app for intoxication detection aerobic exercise to treat depression children as covid-19 super spreader accelerated ice melt in arctic and so on plus as usual news observances and opportunities so stay tuned and keep watching our first story of the week is published in nature energy by a team from cambridge university in the uk the title of the paper is molecularly engineered photocatalyst sheet for scalable solar for meat production from carbon dioxide and water so basically this paper is all about artificial photosynthesis so scientists develops artificial photosynthesis device that produce clean energy like plants do you know the plants convert carbon dioxide and uh, you know water to uh, pr produce something called sugar isn't it so instead of sugar this process that the cambridge scientists have discovered produces a formate which is an anion so photo sheet technology mimics thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast of the green leaves uh, of course it's an artificial process that the scientists have devised so co2 plus h2o uh, give rise to formate anion that is uh, hco2 minus uh, plus oxygen you know so it has uh, you know a solar to formate conversion efficiency of only 0.08 percentage which is not really good uh, probably the scientists will be improving that efficiency later on and previously same researchers had developed an artificial leaf that produced a fuel called syngas but they ran into problems because the device required a range of different components making it harder to scale up and the fuel produced was harder to work with so you know definitely it's a good news but still we have to wait and watch about especially about the scalability uh, because as of now they you know the, the the test device is only 20 centimeters square well lot of questions still remaining including scale up and cost efficiency yet you know this one is a, a pretty good news about artificial photosynthesis many groups are working around the world our second story of the week is again a paper published in Nature Energy, but this time it's by a US team. And it's also quite similar, uh, you know, it is something like photosynthesis, but it's not exactly, it's carbon capture paper. So the title is Highly Selective Electrocatalytic CO2 Reduction to Ethanol by Metallic Clusters Dynamically Formed from Atomically Dispersed Copper. So what this paper is all about, it's a new process that converts carbon dioxide into liquid fuel that is ethanol. So how can you convert that atmospheric CO2 to ethanol, that is what this paper is all about. So the scientists have discovered a new electrocatalyst that converts CO2 and water to ethanol with very high energy efficiency and high selectivity for the desired final product and low cost. So the cost analysis also they did. It's pretty low cost so it's a good news so the authors used carbon supported copper catalyst synthesized by an amalgamated copper lithium method so that is the the technology what that the authors have used it it complements carbon capture and sequestration basically it's a strategy for the mitigation of the climate change because as you know the co2 is a greenhouse gas and somehow we have to get rid of uh, you know the co2 in the atmosphere so if you can uh, capture the co2 and convert the co2 into some other form then definitely uh, uh, to, a, to an extent uh, greenhouse uh, emissions and uh, you know the greenhouse effect and the, the global warming can be ameliorated right so that is uh, that's why it's a ccs that is carbon capture sequestration method however ethanol is not a really a clean energy source because burning it still produces the co2 so that is a uh, the the same problem uh, with any of the biofuels you know though it is a, a renewable energy but if you burn it again it's produce the same thing the co2 and of course this is a greenhouse gas our third paper of the week is a paper titled a sunlight responsive metal organic framework system for sustainable water desalination so it's about the desalination it's a new uh, chemical method that the scientists have developed uh, it is published in the journal nature sustainability by australia china team 
So a team of chemical engineers has developed a sustainable solar powered way to desalinate water in just 30 minutes and uh, it produced 40 gallons of clean drinking water per uh, kilograms of the filtration material and can be used for multiple cycles so it's a very good news you know because the clean energy is one of the uh, sustainable development goals of the UN as you see 2 billion of the 7 billion uh, population of the world which is more than uh, a quarter are in need of the clean drinking water so this process will definitely be of some help for them so uh, the metal organic framework or MOF as a sunlight regenerable iron adsorbent for sustainable water desalination this is the method which they used it under dark condition the zwitter ionic isomer quickly adsorbs multiple cations and anions from the water within 30 minutes with high iron adsorption loadings up to 2.8 nanomole per gram of the sodium chloride with sunlight illumination the neutral isomer rapidly releases these adsorbed salts within four minutes so it's basically a dark light cycle as we will soon uh, see it and figure so how much does it cost the issue with desalination has never been the rate of speed it has always been prohibitively expensive so let us wait and watch uh, after the scale up this technology is really cost efficient isn't it as you can see these are uh, metal organic framework so the cycles are basically desorption and adsorption so if you uh, put this into the dark the, or expose them to the UV then adsorption happens you know adsorption of all these anions and cations on the surface happens and if you expose them to the light that is visible spectra the disassociation or desorption happens so this is a cycle dark so it gets absorbed and visible it gets disassociated so that way you can do a desalination well exciting proof of concept uh, let us wait and watch when this technology really scaled up and uh, hit the market in the near future our fourth story of the week is a paper published in the journal aerosol and air quality research you know AAQR by Indo-German team uh, the authors from India from CSAR National Physical Lab in the New Delhi uh, you know that is a NPL one of the most prestigious lab for physicists in the country so the title of the paper is an overview on the role of relative humidity in the airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in indoor environments uh, you know that what is this paper is all about so it's about the uh, you know what the humidity relative humidity or RR contribute in the transmission rates of COVID-19 the airborne transmission of the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 via aerosol particles indoor environment uh, seems to be strongly influenced by the relative humidity that is what the paper says so a relative humidity of 40 to 60 percentage could reduce the spread of viruses and their absorption through the nasal mucous membrane so it's really interesting as humidity increases spread of virus is less you know as you see that in north india especially here in punjab humidity is very high in august and september so by october humidity became slow so fortunately because of this we see that a decline in transmission of covid 19 is what is expected but uh, unfortunately this is not the case right now but uh, we have to actually wait and watch what what will happen when the you know humidity uh, decreases uh, when october uh, you know we reach october onwards so it's going to be tough time really isn't it so according to the article when there is a higher humidity more than 40 percentage the micro droplets containing the virus actually grow larger and quickly fall out in the air the droplets survive longer and drift further in the low humidity you know during the cold conditions when the humidity is pretty low then it can travel much more f further apart so it's basically winter is really good time for the COVID-19 to transmit in the air so we really have to be extremely careful in the approaching winter season in the northern hemisphere everywhere but you know uh, earlier before reading this paper i always thought that the lower humidity would be better actually because the droplets would dry out in the less humid air but you know that that reasoning is uh, not sound because uh, you know the dryness of our mucous membranes cancel out the thought and more than that it you know it's basically when the humidity increases the size of the particle size of the droplets becomes larger you know and when the humidity decreases the size is decreased I can travel much faster and much longer 
you know it's uh, if you consider it as a uh, airborne disease so this is uh, it's a very interesting finding that uh, indo german team has published in the last week by the way fake news uh, that claims to kill the coronavirus is everywhere alarmingly the rate has tremendously increased i'm really surprised to see this is in financial express yesterday uh, you know it is basically it's a debut a new hope for neutralizing COVID-19 indoor. The article says that a device has been invented by Bangalore-based organization, and uh, you know they are in uh, uh, signed up the deal with Eureka Forbes. So Eureka Forbes is marketing this equipment, and it says that uh, Corona Cannon has the ability to neutralize 99.9 percentage of the coronavirus that might be floating in the air in closed spaces and virtually no scientific backing and whatever the claims that they, they make uh, you know it is really alarming it's actually pseudoscience i would say we really have no clue how this uh, equipment works and the article clearly says that you know it is now going to the eureka forbes is now going uh, to sell this in the indian and asian region and why so only in indian and asian region why not in the us or european or japanese uh, you know they have stringent uh, you know laws and regulations this is ridiculous i'm really surprised and saddened to see that this kind of development and you see that you know how much is the cost of this equipment is without any scientific basis and the company is not even revealing how you know they are what technology that they are using uh, to neutralize the covid-19 indoor so this is a uh, it's a marketing ploy or propaganda you know commercial propaganda and please don't fall into this kind of marketing gym friends. our fifth story of the week is a paper published in american journal of geriatric psychiatry and the title of the paper is experiences of american older adults with pre-existing depression during the beginnings of covid 19 pandemic a multi-city mixed methods study uh, the paper has been published by a u.s team with a uh, uh, 73 number of cohorts involved in this study so the older adults with existing depression show a resilience towards the pandemic that is what the study says so a multi-site study finds that the seniors are more concerned with being infected with covid 19 than the effect of social isolation so uh, you know we were thinking that maybe the covid 19 is going to exacerbate the seniors depression problem but that is not the case they are actually much more resilient on uh, their uh, you know their uh, how they respond to the covid 19 pandemic so we thought they would be much more vulnerable to the stress of covid because they are by cdc definition the most vulnerable population but what we learned is that the older adults with depression can be resilient they told us that coping with chronic depression taught them to be resilient this is what the first author of the study says in a media report and some of the highlights of this study includes participants were more concerned about the risk of contracting the virus than the risk of isolation and depression while all maintained physical distance most didn't feel socially isolated and were using virtual technology to connect with friends and family while they were coping many participants said that the quality of life was lower and they worry their mental health will suffer with continued physical distancing well you know there are actually catches but still overall they were much more resilient and finally participants were upset by the inadequate governmental response to the pandemic uh, probably it's an artifact of any of this questionnaire survey uh, you know the participants always say the government is not doing a good job yet the paper revealed exciting trends that the elder adults you know they were much more resilient than the younger adults in dealing with covid 19 related uh, uh, the mental stress and agony our sixth story of the week is a paper published in journal of pediatrics by a u.s team the title of the paper is pediatric sars cov 2 clinical presentation infectivity and immune responses uh, it included 192 uh, kids uh, the children in the study so the researchers show that the children are silent super spreaders of uh, novel coronavirus you know that is uh, uh, we have actually covered this uh, children as a vectors of this uh, covid 19 uh, pre previously in curiosity channel uh, in the in the very beginning of this program now we have got uh, data affirming this is the case and infected children were shown to have significantly higher level of virus in their airways than hospitalized adults in icus for the covid 19 treatment so the viral load is much much higher for the children so they are real super spreaders and uh, silent spreader unfortunately this is the reality 
so uh, you know it, it's common sense as well usually the children don't have any necessary healthy practices that we hope most adults do the touch and lick anything sneeze without covering cough in people's faces and only barely wash when told etc so all these are conducive to the spread of a viral disease especially the coronavirus and uh, the finding is significant because as schools plan for reopening everywhere in the world we have to be really vigilant about the children and uh, uh, even the decision on reopening the schools our seventh story of the week is a paper published in developmental science by a us team the title of the paper is systematic exploration and uncertainty dominate young children's choices so the paper is again about the children and how, what do they choose uh, do they choose the rewards or exploration that's a very interesting psychology study young children would rather explore than get rewards that is what the study of american 4 and 5 year old finds very exciting and that exploration is not random the study showed that the children approach exploration systematically to make sure they didn't miss anything so this uh, tendency the curiosity you know the childlike curiosity to explore the things we can really make use of it uh, uh, you know while for teaching something you know instead of teaching directly uh, let children learn it by exploring it so that uh, you know that we can actually uh, extend this finding to the preschool education really and exploration should be especially useful for the young children who need information to understand how the world works so probably it's a natural strategy or adaptation for the children this love for exploration and curiosity you know because the information is really important because they had really have to learn how the world works so this information or the love uh, for the the exploration is the innate tendency of all the children you know while adults maximize reward Children exhibited heightened levels of exploration and were characterized by sequential patterns in their choices that approximate uncertainty based exploration. Very exciting, isn't it? They love exploration. So this could be a very good strategy as I told you for, uh, you know, for uh, uh, improving the pedagogical approach in the preschool and school curricula. Uh, instead of simply spoon feeding the children, uh, let them learn the concept themselves by exploring, you know. Our eighth story of the week is a paper published in Psychological Medicine by a uh, US team. Uh, the title of the paper is that a randomized trial of aerobic exercise for major depression, examining neural indicators of reward and cognitive control as predictors and treatment targets. The study involved 66 cohorts. So the, compared with stretching like yoga, aerobic exercise decreased symptoms of major depression by 55% so it, the finding is really significant. Those who saw the greatest benefits showed signs of higher reward processing in their brains pre-treatment suggesting we could target exercise treatment to those people for whom it may be most effective. But unfortunately it is uh, not easy job to find uh, who are going to be benefited out of this uh, uh, you know intervention of prescribing the aerobic exercise so article says that it works in people who tend to have a stronger reward processing system in their brain and there aren't good predictors of whether or not someone has that trait so it's worth trying but it isn't likely to help everyone so some of them definitely going to work on it so why not give a try the problem is that the motivation piece can be the biggest barrier it's not that you know you can simply ask everybody with the depression to go on and run or cycle do the aerobic exercise but the motivation is really really important uh, factor contributing in their uh, you know tolerance for the aerobic their acceptance for the aerobic exercise it's not the laziness in many but actual difficulty in forcing themselves into action you know so that motivation is very very important so that is the reason that people are not inclined to do the exercise they are not really motivated it's not that they are inherently lazy or something like that our ninth story of the week is a paper published in journal of studies on alcohol and drugs uh, by a u.s team and the title of the paper is a preliminary study using smartphone accelerometers to sense gait impairments due to alcohol intoxication and the study involved 133 adults so the, the key point of this study is that can smartphone tell us when you're drunk very exciting right can you trust your smartphone can the smartphone warn you that you're getting really drunk
So researchers from University of Pittsburgh and Stanford University have developed a new way to monitor intoxication using smartphones built-in accelerometer sensor. So using this data, they were able to analyze a person's gait, that is how they walk, and predict if they are intoxicated with 92% accuracy. So it's really, really an exciting piece of information. When past research focused on connections between uh, the number of drinks consumed in the person's gait, this study zoomed in on the blood alcohol concentration, that is BAC, and breath alcohol concentration, that is BRAC. So it is not the number of drinks versus the gait, you know because number of drinks uh, it's, it's highly subjective uh, some people get drunk in just one drink while some others are much more tolerant on alcohol they might not get drunk even after six drinks so the number of drinks is not a proxy for how drunk uh, you got you know so the best option is uh, to look at the blood alcohol concentration or the breath alcohol concentration and then look at the gate like uh, you know the, the study has done so the two most informative accelerometer features were mean signal amplitude so how much is a gate related signal amplitude and variance of the signal in x-axis that is gate sway so amplitude and the variance so these are the two important parameters for the algorithm you know an exciting piece of information uh, probably we'll have to wait for the beginning of the next year for these apps to uh, you know, hit the market, the play stores. Our 10th story of the week is a paper published in the journal The Cryosphere by UK team. The title is the review article Earth's Ice Imbalance. So what this paper is all about. Earth has lost a staggering 28 trillion tons of ice in just 23 years. That is a revelation friends. Earlier studies have shown that the future sea level rise fueled by melting ice sheet might reach 2 plus meters. So what does that mean? 2 plus meter. To put that in context, every centimeter of sea level rise means about a million people will be displaced from their low-lying homelands. Just one centimeter rise, one million people will be displaced. So imagine the impact of 2 meter increase in the sea level because of this ice melting. So setting aside weather related disasters and famine from changing viable croplands, the sea level rise would make about 2% of the people's current homes, that is coastal cities and like, unlivable. That is approximately 180 million people at current population levels are at risk of uh, great displacement and the crop uh, you know that uh, is going to be uh, about the, the changing the viable crop land uh, you know the repercussions are going to be really tremendous because of this the, the increase in sea level a rising sea level also destroys the water table and makes drinking water undrinkable in some areas this is another hidden consequence of rising sea level you know so the the water table also gets uh, polluted with the you know the sea level sea level in, in the saline water salt water intrusion you know and also reduces the albedo effect leading to increased global warming because of the sea ice are uh, largely white in color right so the albedo effect is much higher and when it melts that white color is disappeared and the water absorbs the air radiations from the sunlight so you know it further increases the global warming a related paper has also been published in the journal Communications, Earth and Environment by a US team last week. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a nature paper. So article, the title of the article is Dynamic Ice Loss from the Greenland Ice Sheet Driven by Sustained Glacial Retreat. The summary of the paper is that the Greenland's ice sheet may have passed the point of no return, setting it on an irreversible path to disappearance. So that is what the Ohio State University's uh, paper published in this nature, uh, you know, the journal Communications, Earth and Environment all about. So snowfall can no longer replenish the ice lost as Greenland's glaciers retreat. So it will keep melting and cause catastrophic sea level increase even if the global temperatures stop rising. So it is, uh, it has crossed the threshold, you know. So replenishing the ice sheet and it's melt. So there is a e equilibria, right? So that equilibria is now lost. The climate crisis could bring about other tipping points in Arctic and Amazon, but there may still be the time to avoid those. 
you know those tipping points in amazon and arctic we still have some more time but greenland the tipping point is already over according to this paper that is really alarming friends though governments around the world are not at all concerned about the climate change nobody is talking about climate change neither the media is uh, talking about the climate change last week i also learned that in 2010 a land dispute between india and bangladesh was solved by rising sea levels how rising sea levels can uh, solve a land dispute between india and bangladesh uh, exciting piece of information it's about an island called the new moor island or south telapati island in the sundarbans completely submerged by water and vanished and thus solving the dispute the dispute was solved because neither the country has nothing to do now you know that the island is no more because rising sea level has completely submerged that island look at that catastrophe this is what is now going to happen friends uh, this is no time for political uh, argument you know the earth is only one we have only one home the pale blue dot we all have to unite to save the earth from a man-made catastrophe that is the climate change coming to news from the last week first is covid 19 treatment and vaccine updates uh, there is no update from the last week it remains same from the previous episode of curiosity this Cur episode number 10 we have now three candidates that face three clinical trials that is Gilead Sciences, Royvan Sciences and Regeneron. You know, and the vaccines are also, there are three candidates that face three clinical trials, University of Oxford or AstraZeneca, Moderna Therapeutics and BioNTech or Pfizer. And we also have two candidates that face two clinical trials that is Sinovac and CanSino Biologics. Last week, I also read a story that, uh, you know, it is about the seaweed extract that outperformed the remdesivir in blocking COVID-19 virus. By the way, the remdesivir is in the phase three clinical trial by, you know, as you can see here, Gilead Sciences uh, remdesivir. It is in the phase three clinical trials. And uh, the paper now argues that the seaweed extract that is basically saccharina, you know, the, the brown seaweed uh, or the kelp extracts uh, outperforms this uh, blocking of COVID-19 virus in cell studies. Uh, you know, it's a complex sulfated polysaccharide, so fucoidines extracts from the seaweed Saccharina japonica. But mind that this is a, a cell study that is, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, not really dependable because, uh, you know, the cell study, there are several other cell study that shows that many things, uh, you know, many drugs are potential candidates for treating COVID-19, but that was not the case when we did that in the clinical human trials. So tons of treatments show promise in the cell cultures, but fail for various reasons in the clinical trials. For example, chloroquine, HCQ, you know. So until you have put it through the human trials, this is just hype and hypothesis. In the last week, I also read another algae related story. This is uh, uh, news through the inverse. By the way, inverse is my favorite blog for getting all the science related stories. So the title of this story is a turbo boosted photosynthesis could mean cars running on algae. So cars running on algae is, uh, I'm always suspicious about this, uh, you know, tall claim. Is it really practical or not? But still, uh, the article makes it a strong point. It's about boosting the photosynthesis in algae. How does it do? So it's about the paper published in last week in a journal AAA Science Advances. And uh, the title of the paper is Artificial Regulation of State Transition for Augmenting Plant Photosynthesis Using Synthetic Light Harvesting Polymer Material. So it's basically from PS1 to PS2 tra state transition, they augmented it. This turbo recharge, you know, that the term is turbo boosting. Uh, that actually makes sense. You know, after reading the paper, I'm really convinced that this is going to be an exciting technology uh, in the years to come. Last week, I also learned that the bats can breathe through their wings. Wings make up 85% of the bat surface area and can contribute up to 10% of its gas exchange. Very, very strange kind of information, right? Uh, can ba bat is of course a mammal. How can bats breathe through its wings? You know, so 10% of the gas exchange happens to the wings. And I also learned that the Magellan didn't actually circumnavigate the globe. Uh, you know, that is what we learned in school, right? The first person who circumnavigated the globe is Magellan. But he was killed by a poison arrow in the Philippines. And his expedition under the leadership of Juan Sebastian del Cano completed the trip without him. Wow, that is a revelation. I also heard that uh, the Great Sahara Desert 
supplies much needed phosphorus to the Amazon rainforest via aerial route. Very exciting. I never knew that Sahara's uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, the polar opposite is the rainforest of the Amazon, right? Uh, Amazon is brimming with life while Sahara desert is nothing and it's super hot. But Sahara is supplying the minerals to the Amazon rainforest via the clouds. Uh, very interesting. So without Sahara, no existence of the Amazon rainforest. Exciting piece of information. I never knew that. It's actually done by a study was actually conducted by NASA. The NASA scientist actually constructed a three-dimensional modeling of uh, from the satellite data of uh, how these particles, micro particles and sediments uh, get transported from Sahara Desert to all the way to, uh, you know, the Amazonian rainforest. So this is a, basically, it's a YouTube video. It's a very short video. I linked up in this video in the show notes. So please have a look. It's an, it's an exciting uh, video that I watched last week. Please have a look. And we have covered locust swarms earlier in uh, Curiosity in one of the earlier episodes. Last week I came to know that the locust actually, you know, they uh, avoid the collision. That is a really exciting, it's a curiosity driven information, right? So how do the locust avoid the collision? Locust swarms consist of millions of insects fly across the sky to attack the crops, but individual insects don't collide with each other. How did the locust avoid the collision? That is what the curiosity driven question. Engineers now create a low power collision detector that mimics locust avoidance response which could help in robots, drones and even self-driving cars like this to avoid the collision. So we can learn many things from nature, even from locusts we can learn how to avoid the collision. You know, really exciting piece of information from last week. By the way, last week also I came across many of these uh, fake news, for example, this Tata Digital Health covid three stages all these are completely fake news friends and uh, this fake news also says stay healthy stay safe uh, you know the ph we have covered this ph story mango garlic and lemon um, you know it is acidic so it can kill the coronavirus so uh, distrust all those things so my strategy is i distrust any news that i get through the facebook or whatsapp you know, I don't trust at all. WhatsApp, especially, is a uh, is a big time fake news milling factory, friends. Yet another, uh, you know, the the fake news which I come across uh, last week is this one. This is basically a video or rather an animation about the breathing. So it's uh, they they claim it to be a free COVID nineteen self detection test. Completely fake. Don't uh, ever trust this kind of uh, fake news from uh, you know the the WhatsApp friends. Please never trust these kind of videos and messages uh, that you come across through the WhatsApp. Coming to observances of the next week, uh, you know, we have uh, August 29 is UN International Day Against Nuclear Tests. You know, so for the peace, let peace prevail in the world. So this is a day against a nuclear test. So nuclear fallout and it's never good for any of the citizens of the world, isn't it? So nuclear test, we have to actually object to any country that indulge in this nuclear warfare and nuclear tests. Nuclear disarmament should be the priority of the whole world. August 30 is a UN International Day of Victims of Enforced Disappearances. Friends, how many of you know about enforced disappearances? It's a form of harassment for defenders of free speech and human rights. It's a dirty strategy of, uh, you know, the autocratic governments to spread terror within the society. Of course, enforced disappearances is a serious violation of human rights. Here is a very short video about enforced disappearances from the UN. Uh, I strongly suggest all of you to have a look I linked up in the show notes of this video. And just look at this picture, this lady, the mother looking at the son's picture. It conveys a thousand words, friends. Coming to astronomy related observances of the next week, as you can see, this is a, uh, you know, this is the blue planet, you know, it's an icy planet called Neptune. Uh, coming week is the best time to watch the Neptunes. August 28 is when Moon, Jupiter and Saturn come together. On September 2nd, Venus at its highest in the morning. On September 5th, Moon and Mars close approach and September 11th, Neptune and asteroid fortune are at its opposition. So, so September 11 is the best time to watch Neptune in the sky. But make sure that you have a good telescope. Without telescope, you cannot watch Neptune. Because Neptune is a really small astronomical body, you need to have a telescope to observe the Neptune. Coming to opportunities in the next week, 
uh, we have a COVID-19 funding programs by Azim Premji University, 5th September is the deadline. Sun Pharma Awards, 30th September is the deadline. Barack Biotechnology Ignition Grant, 15th September is the deadline. Indo-Swedish Artificial Intelligence for Health Grant by DBT, 28th August is the deadline. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Curiosity. I hope it has been useful to you. If you like this video, please click thumbs up, share it in relevant groups and subscribe to my channel. Please always wear mask in public places and maintain physical distancing. See you soon in my next video. Goodbye.